Sometimes you just need a hug, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes you need a specific strain of a microbe. That's right. Right? A new friend, Rotori. <laughs> <laughs> so we had the absolute pleasure of connecting with a, just a, a legend in the field of medicine and, and overall health and, and the really pioneered the conversation around wheat and mm -hmm. gut health and gluten. And he's written uh, one of his more recent books called Super Gut. We get to dive into an amazing conversation with Dr. William Davis. And he's just such a sweet man, yeah, right? So fun to listen to and just listen to his insights and how he connects all the dots between the microbiome and your hormones and your immune system, just everything. Yeah. So if you want to learn a little bit more about this oxytocin <laughs> hormone, you know, that loving connection that, that potentially is a big factor in the world that we're living in and why there's so much disconnect, you know? Mm -hmm. Is it a factor in your microbiome, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so listen till the end, um, take notes and enjoy this conversation because I think it's probably one of the most important ones we've had mm -hmm. on this podcast. Absolutely, enjoy. So maybe you're wondering like, what can I do to support my microbiome? There's so many things that we're exposed to on a daily basis that disrupt this really important landscape. Mm -hmm. We're learning more and more about the microbiome and the fact that it influences our mood, our fertility, our hormones, our connection. So we want things in our toolkit that we can utilize every day to support it. Yeah, so one of our favorites is Super Greens uh, by Paleo Valley. So we've got some oligosaccharides, which are part of the prebiotic landscape mm -hmm. that feeds these really Really important microbes. There's also obviously greens powder and some superfoods mm -hmm. and some enzymes to help to break things down. But basically, it's high efficiency assimilation of nutrients with this amazing extra support of the prebiotics. Yeah, because we know if there's inflammation, if there's breakdown of the microbiome, we're not absorbing nutrients. So this allows fast absorption, not only for you, but also kids, which is great. Yeah. So if you want to get access to it, where do you go? Go to Paleo Valley's website and punch in Drs. Jensen, D-R-S-J-E-N-S-E-N-10. It's actually Dr. Jensen 10. Dr. Jensen 10. D-R-J-E-N-E-S-E-N 10. Go get it. Go get it. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Health Ignited with Dr. Sonia Jensen and myself. How's everything today? Good. It's Halloween. Yeah, yeah. that's right. It is Halloween. <laughs> It's funny, yeah. we're having a conversation, uh, we're going to be having a conversation about food and, mm -hmm. and all the different ingredients that you got to look out for when it comes to your food and today's the day. Yes, yeah. and one of the practices that we've had in our family with Halloween is the Switch Witch. Yeah. And so from the beginning, we've taught our kids um, the importance of food. And this really is a day that does create a little bit of anxiety within me because then now they're at school and they're being exposed to all these different foods. And what we implemented was you can still have all the fun, you can still do all the things, but we're just going to switch that stuff out for a toy or something else that's going to give them joy in a different way. Yeah. And, and you know, really what we're doing is we're saving their microbiome. Yes, we are. Which is uh, the conversation we're about to have with, with the legend. I mean, if you've ever considered that wheat may not be working for you, you would have had to come across the book Wheat Belly. And uh, and then there's a new one that uh, Dr. William Davis wrote called uh, Super Gut. And so it's all on the microbiome and what you put in your body and the outcome that that, that leads towards with regards to, to uh, your microbiology and your health and chronic illness and all those things. So he's a man that has such a huge resume, but he's been cardiology for over 25 years. But I wanted to share this quote because the quote really summarizes this man and, and, and his, his passion, his mission in, in the planet. And I'm so excited to dive into the conversation. But let me show you uh, this quote first. So the food you eat is making you sick and the agencies that are providing you with guidelines on what to eat are giving dangerous advice with devastating health consequences. You can change that today. So Dr. William Davis, that was a beautiful quote, really highlighted you know, your mission on this planet, but uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here today. No, thank you guys. It's my pleasure. Well, there, there's so many things to, to discuss with you and you're, you're a man of, you know, uh, you know, many talents and has been in uh, the field of medicine for so many years. And you went from cardiology into looking at the microbiome, you know, uh, on the surface, maybe that seems like a, 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 a disconnect or a completely different field of medicine. But why why is this such an important conversation for you right now? 
You know, Nick, I saw all kinds of wonderful things happen to people just by following some of the basic ideas in the Wheat Belly series, which is boils down to don't eat anything made of wheat and related grains because they never belonged in the human diet in the first place. We don't have the digestive enzymes to break down many of the proteins in grains. and They have toxic effects and often significant toxic effects. And people blame bad genes or bad luck. No, it's the wheat you're eating. So doing that and then addressing a handful of nutrients that are largely lacking in modern life, not because of the diet, but because of modern habits, like simple things, like you can't drink water from the uh, ocean, river, stream, lake. It's contaminated. It's, it's, it's filthy. It's got sewage and other things in it. So we filter all our water and water filtration removes all magnesium. So we supplement magnesium. Uh, we live in northern latitudes. We wear clothes and uh, uh, we, we work indoors. We don't get enough vitamin D. Got to get vitamin D. So iodine, omega-3 fatty acids, a handful of nutrients that whose need is programmed into the human genetic code, but we're not getting. So we address those things too. So that simple combination of things achieves so much because uh, among its effects is it reverses insulin resistance and an inflammation, that collection, that synergistic collection of strategies. I also included some basic microbiome strategies, a high potency multi-species probiotic and prebiotic fibers and fermented foods. But even then, although people had dramatic improvements in health, there were some residual problems, most notably food intolerances. People would say, yeah, I lost 73 pounds and I'm off four blood pressure medicines and I'm no longer a type two diabetic, but I still can't eat uh, nightshades or, or FODMAPs or legumes or histamine containing foods. If I do, I get diarrhea and bloating and panic attacks and asthma, all that kind of stuff. Uh, other people would say things like this. Yeah, I lost 73 pounds, but I'm stuck and I need to lose another 50. And I don't know why it's not coming off. Or my hemoglobin A1C improved so much, went down from 12.7%, which is disastrous, down to 6.2%, so much, much better, but far short of perfect, which is 5.0% or less. And so I started looking for what, what is persisting? What is residual? And I looked at the microbiome, and lo and behold, there are extraordinary solutions coming out of the emergent science of the microbiome. Love it. You know, you shared some things, and, and I listened to you lecture um, on this, and, and you shared it just at the beginning of the talk, and that was those intrinsic needs. Because I think we we want to get all sophisticated with, you know, you need this probiotic, you need this program. And, you know, you really hit home the point that if you're not doing some of these basic human needs that's intrinsic to our physiology, you can try to get as creative as you want to. But we, we miss this really important step. And you highlighted that just at the beginning here. Can you just kind of go over that just a little bit more? Because I think it's so important for people to appreciate that you can't just jump into the really fascinating different protocols, but you got to take care of the basics, right? Exactly right. It, this is a really tough concept for a lot of people to understand, but it's the idea of getting away from introducing exogenous out external agents like drugs uh, or things that are really not part of human need. They're not programmed into your genetic code. So there's no deficiency, for instance, of ashwagandha. So not to say it might not have a role, but to say that your expectations should be low for something that's whose need is not programmed into your genetics. What if you instead address the things that are lacking and program into your genetic code that if you don't get them, bad stuff happens? Vitamin D is a good uh, example. If you don't get vitamin D, you have impaired immunity, you have impaired bone health, you have seasonal affective disorder, you have higher insulin resistance, higher inflammation. Restore D, this thing you're, we are supposed to get all along, and wonderful things happen. So when we address intrinsic need, you get these much bigger effects. So it would be the difference, let's say, in a type 2 diabetic. So conventional approach, of course, give you medications like insulin to force your blood sugar down, but never address the cause. How about we instead we address the insulin resistance? That is the liver, brain, muscle don't respond to insulin. The pancreas compensates by producing huge, up to a hundredfold more insulin than normal because your body's resistant to it. And you have sky high levels of insulin in your bloodstream, even though your blood sugar is high. Uh, and that high insulin has all kinds of adverse effects, including accelerated aging, by the way, and dementia, promotes dementia. Uh, but what if we instead of forcing blood sugar down, we addressed insulin resistance? Don't eat foods that raise insulin and sugar. 
address those nutrients lacking in modern life that um, uh, influence insulin resistance and address the microbiome. Insulin resistance drops, blood sugar drops, weight loss, blood pressure drops. In other words, you don't have side effects when you do that, when you address the underlying causes, you get huge side benefits. So it's a very different approach to, to health. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think the reason why this is a challenging topic for many, because it's a lot of self-responsibility too. It's almost easier to take the exogenous things and feel like, okay, these things are going to fix what's going on for me and not have to change the habits, not have to change the way we're eating and sleeping and moving and all these things, because maybe life isn't allowing that change in routine, but it really is that aspect of taking that responsibility of self and knowing oneself too. So in your work and your um, years of working with others too, have you noticed a difference in people with different backgrounds and how their needs might be different from somebody else's needs? So for example, my family's from India, Nick's family's from Northern Europe. So would you say that genes play a role in how my body might respond to certain needs like vitamin D and all these things in comparison to Nick's family, for example? No, no doubt. There's, there's differences in the way you process vitamin D, the receptor for vitamin D, your susceptibility with, with sun exposure. But, you know, I, I think for the most part, we're all pretty much alike more or less so that regardless of genetic background or ethnic background, we all need vitamin D. It's not like some don't need it and some need it. Mm. Likewise, uh, magnesium, this simple, stupid, basic thing, magnesium, uh, because the world has to drink filtered water. I mean, there are populations that don't, um, and that's a little different story, but the vast majority of modern people have to filter their water. Just That's just the reality of life. And water filtration removes magnesium. So it's that, that's not genetic. There's no genetic, genetic variation in that need. So most of these kind of basic things are not all that susceptible to ethnic or geographic or um, uh, other sorts of genetic differences. Yeah, I guess outside of environment, right? You know, you mentioned the vitamin D thing, you know, because we are in the Pacific Northwest or, you know, Northern climates, our demand is probably going to be higher as a result of our geography. But yeah, interesting point, you know, because I think that we're, we're, we're often looking for the needle in the haystack or the, the uniqueness of us in our situation. But that's why I really love that that approach that you, that you take with regards to these intrinsic needs. And it's just part of living on this planet. They, these are these are essentials in order to have any sort of resemblance of what true health could look like. So I love that you you really touch on if that. We, if we just got the world to do the basics, yeah, diet, nutrients lacking reorder your microbiome, just the basic things. You would see a dramatic transformation in health. You would see a dramatic drop in the reliance on healthcare. And we don't need to talk about things like rhodiola or ashwagandha. Not to say they can be useful for limited purpose, but just addressing the basic needs is a big deal. Yeah. And it's such an important starting point. So I really wanted to make sure that you really rounded that conversation up because I, I think that if people really started to pay attention there, like you said, we could take some of the pressure off of emergency rooms and some of these chronic disease pictures that that people are stuck with when they're visiting their GP. So another, another piece you spoke about, you talked about people making these dietary changes and then, you know, they're making progress. They lost the, they lost the, you know, double, double digit, you know, pounds and they're making progress, but they're still really rigid in their dietary consumption because maybe there hasn't really been that movement in the microbiome. Can you talk about, can you talk about that stuckness that people get stuck in and, and what that breakthrough mechanism actually looks like for somebody? You know, it's become clear, the science is pretty clear on this now, that as modern humans, having been exposed to such things as repeated courses of antibiotics, glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup herbicide, which is also an antibiotic, food additives like preservatives, you know, preservatives keep uh, molds and bacteria out of your food but also in you, they kill off microbes in you, emulsifying agents. There's good evidence that polysorbate aid and carboxymethylcellulose, very common mixing agents, disrupt the human microbiome, chlorinated drinking water, other drugs like stomach acid blocking drugs, anti-inflammatory drugs like naproxen and uh, ibuprofen, and on and on. on. Numerous factors in modern life have disrupted the human microbiome, but specifically have caused loss of numerous healthy species, species that were doing good things for us. Well, when you lose these those, those good guys, they were suppressing the pathogens, mostly fecal microbes. And so f- when this happens, the fecal microbes proliferate. And I think by my estimation, one in two people 
these fecal microbes have also ascended up into the 24 feet of small bowel where they don't belong. And the key here is that, so these microbes, fecal species like E. coli and Klebsiella and Citrobacter and Campylobacter and Pseudomonas, that they, that they now dominate. And the important thing to know is that these trillions of microbes inhabiting now 30 feet of entire GI tract die. They only live for a few hours. And when they, there's those trillions of microbes living and dying in rapid succession. When they die, many of their breakdown products enter the bloodstream, first in the portal system, then the systemic circulation. Uh, and that's called endotoxemia because the component of the cell wall that's getting into the bloodstream is called endotoxin. And the small bowel has only a thin, fragile, single layer mucus barrier, unlike the colon. The colon's used to these microbes. <laughs> that's where they're supposed to be. But the small bowel is not. And so that fragile, single layer mucus barrier is not much barrier to the entry of this endotoxin. But that very fundamental process now makes it crystal clear how microbes in the GI tract can be experienced as depression in the brain or dementia or Parkinson's disease or as the joint and muscle pain of fibromyalgia or rheumatoid arthritis, or as metabolic diseases like obesity, type two diabetes and insulin resistance. In other words, virtually all modern diseases have to be reconsidered in light of the contribution of the microbiome. So it, it, it's gonna disrupt a lot of the things we do in practice, but it's also going to yield all kinds of new and far more effective uh, insights into how to manage these conditions. So can we talk about that mechanism of ascension? You know, is it, is it, um, you know, is it just as a result of, you know, stripping out the natural microflora that now there's these opportunistic bugs that are just, you know, finding their way upstream or is there dismantling of the ileocecal valve or what, what is that communication that, that opens between the, the large and small bowel? Yeah, that's part of it, right? The the loss of the tonicity of the ileocecal valve that keeps fecal microbes from ascending. But it's also other things. And the whole list has not yet been uh, created. Right. But it includes such things as stomach acid blocking drugs, because acid is a very effective barrier to oral microbes. Well, you know, the, the oral cavity is second only to the colon in the density mm -hmm. of microbes. Mm -hmm. And so when you swallow and you don't have stomach acid, you're now populating your upper bowel with oral microbes. And those oral microbes are not necessarily good for your small bowel. And likewise, when you lose stomach acid, you allow fecal microbes to ascend. Now, the loss of stomach acid could be from stomach acid blocking drugs, or it could be from um, uh, atrophic, uh, from um, autoimmune gastritis, which is quite common, by the way, autoimmune loss of parietal cells that produce stomach acid, or it could be due to H. pylori. H. pylori is not as big a problem in the US as it is in some parts of the world. But still, 15% of Americans still have H. pylori, and that causes a low-grade inflammation. And those are the people who develop ulcers, uh, as well as gastritis, and that can lead to loss of stomach acid. Then there's some other issues that lead to the ascendance, but the whole list of reasons why these microbes ascend is not entirely clear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what you're describing here, is this what we are now labeling as SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, Dr. Sonia, I, I was guilty of thinking SIBO was this rare thing. And this mm -hmm. is what turned the corner for me. This this little device here, this is the old one. The, the new one is black, but it's the air device, A-I-R-E. And you blow into it and it registers on your smartphone, scale of zero to 10. This device only measures hydrogen. The new one measures hydrogen and methane. These are gases produced by microbes. Now, when the device first came out, uh, Dr. Angus Short, uh, the PhD engineer in Dublin, Ireland, invented it for his wife. She she had IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, and was told to go on a low FODMAPS diet, low fiber, low sugar diet. And he, she she did, but he saw how she got tripped up and she'd had gas and bloating. And so he invents this to detect hydrogen gas that results when you ex have those fibers or sugars. Well, they release it as a device for this little narrow area of IBS on a low FODMAPS diet. So I get a hold of it. I call him up. I say, Angus, that's not what this is. <laughs> yeah, you can use it for that reason. I'm telling the inventor what he invented, right? <laughs> so I said, Angus, this is, this is a mapping device. He's an engineer. We can't expect him to know everything about human health, right? But I said, it's a mapping device. It tells you where, to, where microbes are living. But in, in order to do it, you, to use it for that purpose, though, you have to change the rules what they tell you in the instructions. So I wrote the rules out in my super gut book. It's, it tells you how to use it as a mapping device. And lo and behold, I have thousands of people testing. 
It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's the occasional person who tests negative. And it took me by side. What? No way. Everybody's testing positive. Well, you can say maybe the device is flawed. Well, this is what happened, though. People would say, oh, yeah, I've, I've had bloating for years or I had fibromyalgia for years or I had restless leg syndrome for years. All these uh, conditions virtually synonymous with SIBO. So they test positive. Let's say a baseline 1.2. They ingest something that microbes eat like inulin powder uh, or raw potato starch, uh, something that microbes metabolize. And you test, and let's say 45 minutes later, you're at a 10. That's a positive. Rise of four or more units is a positive. Uh, corresponding to each unit corresponds to five parts per million on a standard test, on a test in a clinic or lab. So people are testing positive. Well, then we take steps to eradicate the SIBO. I, I want to talk about that too. And they test negative again. And they say, and I finally broke my weight loss plateau. I finally can eat uh, um, histamine containing foods again, or legumes, or, or uh, nightshades. In other words, all those food intolerances go away. Or they say my hemoglobin A1C finally dropped to 4.9. In other words, I saw all the residual problems go away when there was normalization of breath, hydrogen, gas. Now, the, the kicker here is, there's only, as you guys likely know, there's only a few ways to normalize SIBO. One would be take an antibiotic. You know, I'm kind of reluctant to suggest that. Antibiotics got us here and we're going to mm -hmm. treat them from more antibiotics, but you could use an antibiotic like rifaximin, not absorbed. It does work probably about 50% of the time, maybe a little better than that. You could use uh, some herbal antibiotics. Only two have been validated in clinical trials. That's the candibactin regimen and the FC cytal dysbiocide regimen. We were using that with some with good success, by the way. But then I started thinking about this. So if I have SIBO, 30 feet of microbes, right, kind of ruining my, my health and life, if I just take a probiotic, will the SIBO go away? No, you guys know it won't go away. It might reduce the blood. What do you mean it doesn't go away? That's That's not fair. <laughs> So I thought, well, what if we chose the microbes differently? What if we chose microbes that colonize the upper GI tract where SIBO occurs? And what if we chose species and strains that produce bacteriocins, natural antibiotics, effective against the species of SIBO? So I chose three, a strain of lactobacillus gasseri, colonize the upper GI tract, produces up to seven bacteriocins, lactobacillus ruteri, likewise, Upper GI tract colonizer for up to four bacteriocins and it's a strain of bacillus coagulans. Now we go a step further. We ferment prolonged fermentation in yogurt, not, not store-bought yogurt. I, I regret calling it yogurt. It's not yogurt. It looks and smells like yogurt, <laughs> but it's not yogurt. We're going to ferment these things. We use dairy. It doesn't have to be dairy. And we ferment it for 36 hours. So like rotori, one of the components in this mixture, doubles every three hours typically at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 37 degrees Celsius. So if you ferment like you do in a factory for three or four hours, you've got nothing. We're going to ferment for 36 hours to allow to double a minimum of 12 times. And if you do the math, you get billions, hundreds of billions. And we did flow cytometry on our yogurts. And we get some, something around 250 to 300 billion microbes per half cup serving. So we're getting a because wow. we, we want a big, powerful effect for the SIBO. So we call this SIBO yogurt and it's delicious. Have it with some blueberries and chia seeds. And we do a half cup a day. And so far across my fingers, 40 people have normalized their hydrogen breath by the air device. Now we will do a formal clinical trial. We can't use yogurt. We'll have to encapsulate it, but mm -hmm. nothing hits rid of SIBO 90% of the time. And so I was, I was shocked I did not expect that to happen. I thought, oh, maybe 30% will respond favorably, but no, but we're getting about 90% response. So we will undertake a more formal analysis down the road. But I, but you know what? When, when the, if I said the solution to the SIBO was remove your small bowel, well, you better be damn confident that's necessary and, and helpful, right? What if I said the solution is make some yogurt? Mm. You know? Much more <laughs> you attractive. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to be absolutely. And in fact, I think it's reasonable. Somebody says, you know, I, I've had fibromyalgia for 10 years. I've taken Lyrica and prednisone and antidepressants. I think I, I'm just going to try the SIBO yogurt. You know, you don't, you don't have to do this. It is helpful, but you don't have to. If you think there's 
uh, signs that you have SIBO, like those conditions synonymous with SIBO, or fat malabsorption, seeing fat drops in the toilet, uh, or intolerance to foods, especially prebiotic fibers, like onions, garlic, shallots, uh, root vegetables. If you had any of those kind of telltale signs, I, given the, the, the benign nature of making the yogurt, uh, it, it'd be reasonable just to proceed empirically. That is based on your best judgment. And by the way, especially gasserai and rotorai are probably among the most important keystone species. That is kind of foundational species that support other microbes. And it's probably the loss of those two, maybe some others, why there is an epidemic of SIBO. Because those two were supposed, we were supposed to have them all along, even though they're great as bacteria in producing microbes, they're also very susceptible to common antibiotics. So if you took amoxicillin, for instance, for an upper respiratory infection or a urinary tract infection 20 years ago, you lost your good uh, species and that allows SIBO to occur. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. It almost puts it into the category of, of what you started with at the beginning with intrinsic needs. It's just, it's in, intrinsic to your physiology and microflora for those species to be there. Mm-hmm. Good point, Nick. Yeah. yeah. So if we were to assess the microbiome of a raccoon or a skunk or a squirrel or a deer, they all have rotary. Mm-hmm. If we were to micro, assess the microbiome of an indigenous population that is indigenous, un, untouched by Western society, like people living in the mountains of New Guinea or the Brazilian rainforest or the highlands of Peru or some parts of Tanzania and Kenya or Malawi, they all have rotary. <laughs> suggesting yeah. this is a necessary microbe, yet we've almost all lost it. And so exactly right, Nick, when you replace something that we're supposed to have had, big effects. So I think you guys know one of the biggest effects is from restoration of that rotary, one of the three components in the SIBO yogurt. You can also make rotary by itself as a yogurt. And that one is a spectacularly effective microbe. One of the effects is it takes up, so it takes up residence, entire, entire GI tract, sends a signal via the vagus nerve to the hypothalamus in the brain to release more oxytocin, the mm-hmm. hormone of love and empathy. So people say things like, you know, I feel closer to my partner. I feel closer to my family. I'm more tolerant of my coworkers. I'm more generous. And my favorite, I'm more accepting of other people's opinions, even if I disagree. But the ladies love it because there's an explosion in dermal collagen and they start to lose their wrinkles, especially crow's feet and smile lines. Uh, guys love it because it restores youthful muscle and strength. And we're, we're seeing a 50% rise in testosterone in, in guys. Mice can get a three to 400% increase in testosterone, uh, older mice. Uh, but I'm seeing in uh, middle-aged men about a 50. Now we will assess that formally to, to document that, but I'm seeing it repeatedly, about a 50% rise in testosterone. There's also an acceleration of healing. There's deepening of sleep, which I love because I'm a chronic insomniac. Now I sleep mm-hmm. <laughs> easily, eight, nine hours, vivid, colorful, childlike dreams. Wow. Uh, there's a preservation of bone density. We know that with good evidence. There's an uh, increase in libido. You know, there's something the gynecologists now call the genital urinary syndrome of menopause. It, that's that's the umbrella term for all the phenomena of menopause, you may know. Uh, that includes loss of libido, vaginal atrophy, that is dryness, irritation, discharge, pain, um, pain with sex, and the urinary complaints, urge incontinence, you laugh and you, you wet yourself, and mm-hmm. repeated urinary tract infections. I mean, a big problem for a lot of ladies. And as women, uh, Dr. Sonia knows this, as you proceed into your 60s and 70s, it becomes almost universal. It happens to most, almost all ladies. Well, I think the rotary reverses, not all, but many of those phenomena. It, we know it has uh, marked vaginal effects. And so uh, really interesting effects. That's one microbe. So, so would you say that the rotary has a connection to estrogen as well as oxytocin? Because a lot of what you're describing also shows up when estrogen declines. So I'm curious if you've seen that interconnectedness too. I mean, of course, as soon as it's influencing the hypothalamus, it's going to influence most of our hormones. But I'm curious if you've seen a direct link in any way. You know, we had uh, all the fractions of estrogen and FSH, LH in our first clinical trial. I had to take them out because of budgetary reasons. Uh, so we, we should have that data, by the way. It's a very simple trial looking at 
what's called high resolution skin ultrasound to measure dermal thickness and a, me a method the uh, dermatologist called corneometer for measure objective measurement of skin moisture, as well as uh, computer assisted scoring of, of wrinkles. So that trial is finished. We, just, we haven't analyzed the data yet. And I had estrogens in there, but I had to take it out just because of budgetary reasons. Down the road, we'd we, we like to do that, but no one has done that yet. So we really don't know. Mm -hmm. But I'm basing my observations with oxytocin. Uh, it's extrapolated. We have not done this trial. and But if you look at the five clinical, tri clinical trials in which ladies um, have been given, sorry, Joe. have been given intravaginal oxytocin suppositories, it restores the vaginal epithelium and moisture and sensation and all that. So uh, because one of the effects of Rotary, of course, is to provoke a uh, release of oxytocin, I got to believe, and it, it's experienced in the brain, in muscle, in skin, in the lighting cells that produce testosterone in males. I got to believe it has the same effect in, um, it has an effect on the vaginal epithelium also. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. I mean, yeah. as people are listening, they're like, where do I get this yogurt from? <laughs> so, <laughs> so you got instructions in your book, right? Yeah. So yeah. it is a bit inconvenient because you have to source the three microbes from different places. Um, and you also need a device like a yogurt maker, instant pot, um, a sous vide device, sticker basin sous vide. Uh, and we ferment it. I, I also throw in a prebiotic fiber to nourish the microbes. You get a little bit better result when you do that. It's not absolute, but it, a little better result. It's like throwing cow manure on your tomato patch. You get bigger tomatoes. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh -oh. <laughs> So I have a question around SIBO, just with patients that I've seen and just hearing other individuals that um, have SIBO, they often really, it's almost like it becomes an identity and they do these things to treat it. And then they go off and they eat certain things and, oh, my SIBO is acting up or my SIBO has come back. So if someone were to go through a protocol like this, is, is there a tendency for it to still show up again if those triggers come back into life, like the nightshades or the histamine foods or whatnot? Or does it create enough resilience that the body is able to now handle these external stressors that were there before? You know, if you if you clear the, the, the runway with, say, an antibiotic like rifaximin or one of the herbal antibiotics, you really haven't rebuilt a healthy microbiome and you certainly haven't replaced those microbes lost from the small bowel like rotary and gasserai. So I think a better solution is, while I call it SIBO yogurt, I kind of regret that because what it's really doing is restoring lost keystone microbes. But of course, I should explain what I mean by keystone to your listeners. So uh, plankton in the ocean are keystone because they support whales and jellyfish and other filter feeders. If you lose plankton, you lose whales and jellyfish. So that would be, so plankton would be a collection of keystone species. Uh, Reuteri and Gasseri are among these others that are keystone species. So if you lose them, all kinds of bad stuff happens. You lose other microbes. So key is to restore the keystone microbes. We don't have all the full list of all the keystone species, but those two are definitely on it. And because they have that's those special characteristics of colonizing the upper GI tract where SIBO occurs and producing bacteria. And so I think I'm seeing is people who do the SIBO yogurt for four weeks to eradicate their SIBO and test negative on the on the air device, and then continue the yogurt maybe every third day or so, don't seem to have recurrences, at least not as much. So I think we've stumbled onto something. This is anecdotal, though a fairly substantial anecdote um, that we need to prove. But I think uh, we just stumbled on something just by sheer reasoning, logic. Yeah, I think it's such a powerful conversation with regards to you know do we you know so much of medicine is about you know, wiping things out you know sort of the war on drugs the war on everything like there's always a war in the you know especially when it comes to our health too like the war on the gi tract and it and we we get really stuck and indoctrinated in this idea that we have to attack in order to you know rebuild or what have you but you know, I love the idea of really coaxing the body back into its natural state so that those microbes that aren't supposed to be there, there's no need for them to be there. There's always a reason. And I look through the lens of adaptation that these cr critters are just manifesting as a result of the environmental impact. They're not intrinsically bad. They're not out to kill us. They're the result of our environments, our, our emotional state, our, our 
uh, the way that we move through stress to the, all the environmental stressors and toxins that impact. And so I love this natural approach to really getting the body back into a state of balance and resilience, because essentially you're, you're intrinsically putting that resilience back in the body. It's, it's a beautiful mechanism. And what other strategy makes you love people more and mm-hmm. makes you, you know, a, a better human being and more generous. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's, uh, I, I cringe to think, uh, you know, is this a big part of the reason, by the way, to explain the explosion of um, social isolation, yeah. divorce, mm-hmm. the rise of narcissistic behavior? I, I think it is. Not to say those things don't have other causes. Of course they do. But do we have, just by this simple act of replacing this one lost microbe and boosting oxytocin, could we make a contribution to improving the social fabric? I, I think we can. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we often say that all dis-ease is due to disconnect. Mm-hmm. And if we're able to create that connection within the physiology and then also our emotional body, then it will create that connection in our social societies too. And we can just see the other in such a different, from such a different lens, instead of that lens that's contracted, that's hurt, or it's in pain. But when we're, when we clear that ability to digest life, because now our digestive system is also supporting that, it, I think it can shift everything. You know, there's a very important question in suicide. That is, there's now five clinical trials that have demonstrated that people who attempt suicide and people who succeed in suicide when their cerebrospinal fluid, you know, in the brain or spinal cord uh, or blood uh, levels of oxytocin are studied, they're 50% lower than other people who are Mm non-suicidal. So uh, wouldn't it be interesting to get a hold of some of those people who've attempted suicide, sequence their, their microbiome, measure their plasma or salivary oxytocin and see if there's a connect. Because if that's true, you know this, Dr. Sonia, if, if you have somebody who you think is, is at risk for suicide and you ask them, hey, John, are you thinking of killing yourself? Oh, no, no. And they do. Mm-hmm. Is there some way to, is there a bio, bioassay, a biomarker for a suicide ideation or suicide risk? Not really. So, not to say there have been many, many attempts to find one like cortisol and epinephrine and and um, serotonin, et cetera. But this may prove to be, I, I, was, I tried to write the federal grant to get this fund, uh, study funded. It's a very difficult study to perform, by the way. But think of what we could do. If that were true, can we assess someone's, even say a salivary oxytocin and know that they're genuinely at risk for suicide and then perhaps even maybe have a solution to it? Not to say there aren't other reasons for people with thinking suicidal thoughts, uh, money problems, relationship problems, of course. But what if we had that little edge, that little nudge that puts that sense of hopefulness, of camaraderie, of desire for human connection? What if we could restore that? Would that be just enough to impact what is a skyrocketing suicide rate even, that developed even pre-pandemic? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the more we look at emotions and all the various um, stresses that we carry, the more we know that there's a physiological response that happens first, and then the emotional response follows due to what's happening in that physiology. So if we have those markers, so would you say that everyone should map out their GI? And and what's your opinion on um, tests that do that, like the gut zoomer and some other various ones that I know we haven't, we don't even know all that exists in, in when it comes to the microbiome, but just curious what your thoughts are on that. There's a lot of challenges with stool testing. One of the challenges among the many challenges is that if you said, so if Nick says, I want to know, do I have lactobacillus roteri? And if so, what strain? (laughs) Well, you have to use a method called uh, shotgun metagenomic sequencing or other rapid, this terminology is terrible, or other rapid throughput testing methods. In other words, the most common method, which is 16S ribosomal RNA gene detection, will not tell you that. So the most common testing platforms, all they'll say is something like this, Nick, you've got lactobacillus. And Nick says, well, yeah, lactobacillus brevis, lactobacillus rotori, lactobacillus acidophilus, which one? We can't tell you because we didn't take it down to that level. So the the tests that drive all the way down to species and strain. And there's only a couple of test platforms that do that and, and quantify so um, the uh, gut zoomer that you mentioned does that. Thrive does that. 
Um, Viome gives the appearance of doing that, but they really don't because they don't quantify. If you have a nasty microbe, like uh, the very interesting Fusobacterium nucleatum, a microbe that starts in the mouth, so you guys may know, uh, everybody, most people have it, but if you have bleeding gums, gingivitis, or periodontitis, it skyrockets and oddly co colonize the colon. By the way, not through sputum swallowing, but through the bloodstream. It's an excellent example of this newly appreciated phenomenon called translocation. These microbes don't stay where they're supposed to be. They gain access to other places like your thyroid or your breast tissue or your uh, prostate or your brain. In this case, this mouth microbe colonized the colon and it's looking like a major cause for colon cancer, which means if that's true, early cancer detection shouldn't rely on something as late and silly as a colonoscopy. It would rely on composition of the microbes that cause the cancer. And maybe colon cancer therapy should include some means of eradicating fusobacterium. But another example of how uh, insights in the microbe are going to change everything we think about in, um, in healthcare. That's a fascinating idea is that translocation. I mean, that must be happening all over the place. Like it's obviously, if it's happening in the mouth, it must be happening in the GI tract as well. You know, a great example. So a third of the world's females have vaginal dysbiosis, disrupted of, disruption of the vaginal microbiome, which usually means it varies from race to race, region to region, but typically it involves a loss of lactobacillus species, especially crispatus, and proliferation of species like Gardnerella, vaginalis and adipobium and some others and, and, and fecal microbes. Well, uh, if you restore the normal vaginal microbiome, it restores the urinary microbiome mm. and reduces urinary tract infections and urge incontinence. Now, wait a minute here. How can you take an, a, a microbe orally as a probiotic? So let's say I take a probiotic that contains lactobacillus crispatus. I take it, or not me, but a woman takes it. <laughs> a woman takes it orally. It colonized the vagina. How did it get there? There's no connection between the GI tract vagina, except via contiguity, nearness in the perineum, the perineal area. So is it via stool? <laughs> and then secondarily, it also colonized the bladder. That, you know, Dr. Sonia knows we thought for years that the bladder was sterile. And only people with urinary tract infections had been like, no, the bladder has its own microbiome. But the urinary microbiome is determined by the vaginal microbiome, even though there's no direct connection that we know of. But that's mm -hmm. the, another sort of translocation. The exact mechanism is presumptively uh, contiguity via the perineum. But is there something else? Maybe. But it, it, exactly right. You know, um, another example of uh, disadvantageous translocation is the gall is gallstones. You know, the gallbladder, the, the bile duct empties into the duodenum, which of course is 24 feet up from the colon. Well, if you study those gallstones for the microbes, you'll find fecal organisms like E. coli and clips. Now, what are stool organisms doing in the gallstones 24 feet up <laughs> above the colon? Another form of now that would be the SIBO form of translocation. So you're right, Nick. It is a re, it's a completely eye opening new world of explaining how things happen. Mm -hmm. I hope the women listening specifically, just I'm thinking about the urinary tract and the vaginal microbiome, they're having some aha moments, especially in those perimenopausal menopausal years, because often they're coming in with chronic UTIs, like that like you spoke about in the beginning of our chat, and for them to make that connection between the microbiome and their urinary tract and how it's all so intimately connected. As you know, the conventional solutions for those problems are kind of lousy. Mm -hmm. A repeated course of antibiotics. And of course, mm -hmm. every course of antibiotic a woman takes, her, her overall microbiome deteriorates further and further and further. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and of course, solutions like estrogens are not solutions. I mean, say to a woman, if you want better vaginal health and maybe bone health, so you're going to have to risk thromboembolic disease and maybe endometrial cancer, even with a suppository sort of form of, of estrogen. In other words, we, women have terrible choices. The estrogen mimics, the CIRMs are, are no better. They're terrible. The two drugs for libido are terrible. The FDA is contemplating a retraction of their approval because they don't work. So women just have lousy choices. 
I mm. think the answer is going to come from the microbiome. Yeah. What would your opinion about interstitial cystitis be then? You mean as a, a E. coli issue? Yeah. And just the microbiome. Yeah. You know, I don't know a lot about that specific condition. Mm-hmm. I will say this, oddly, I've seen a number of cases. Re- I'm talking about people with creatinines of 3.6 or 4.2. So well down the path of kidney failure. And I've seen them regress entirely, not with microbes so much, but with um, uh, wheat and grain elimination. Mm-hmm. So that, I did not perform a trial. This is anecdote. But when you see something like that revert back to a creatinine of 1.2, and histologic normalization of, of the kidneys. I mean, you got to believe there's a there's a connection, but I, I did not perform a clinical trial. I know there's some work on some of the microbes. Uh, I take it back. I'm thinking of interstitial cystitis. So I, I, I'm sorry, Dr. Stein, I don't have any more insight mm-hmm. into interstitial cystitis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's okay. I was I mean, kind of curious because most of the women that have it are put on just chronic antibiotics. So mm-hmm. there must be I'm some... sorry, you did say interstitial cystitis, right? I did, yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm hearing interstitial nephritis. No, cystitis, yeah. <laughs> so I saw the nephritis part of it go away with wheat and grain elimination. The mm-hmm. cystitis part, I can't say I've seen enough, I, but there's some very interesting signs coming out of Northwestern, two, two guys I know, um, who are, they have worked with a strain of, of all things, E. coli. Mm-hmm. So E. coli is typically thought of as a pathogen, right? It causes urinary tract infections. It causes vaginitis. It causes sepsis. Um uh, but there's a, as an example of E. coli can be a really nasty thing. It can cause, uh, um, death, some of the really pathogenic strains, but there's also a probiotic strain of E. coli. It's called E. coli Nissel 1917. You may recall, this was isolated from a soldier in world war one and a French doctor noticed that, uh, this guy never got sick. Everyone else is getting cholera and dysentery. This one guy was not. So he's, he's, he got his stool using culture, old fashioned culture methods and found a strain of E. coli that provides protection from dysentery and cholera. Well, there's also a strain of E. coli that uh, when put into the bladder of a woman who is re- experiencing repeated urinary tract infections, she no longer gets urinary tract infections. Now that's not clinically available and trying to get it to the bladder is not quite worked out. Uh, One, the FDA says you can't call E. coli a probiotic in the U.S., so that's a problem. And two, to get it into the bladder directly, no one knows if you take it orally, if it will colonize the the bladder via the vagina. So what they're doing is either going through the skin and injecting into the bladder or up the urethra with a a catheter. So not ready for prime time, (laughs) but that, that apparently has beneficial effects in interstitial cystitis. So I'm hopeful that that or something similar will emerge as a solution for interstitial cystitis. Mm, very cool. Love it. Mm-hmm. I know we're getting close to, to the end, but I just do want to ask, where, where do you see yourself going from here as far as your, your research and, and the, the book study that you're looking into? Like what, what, what's sort of the next frontier that you feel is important for people to really pay attention to? You know, Nick, I tell you, you guys are too young to appreciate what I'm saying, but I'll tell you anyway. <laughs> so I, I tell people it's 1982 and I just gave you a Commodore 64 computer, 64K memory. There's no talk of gigabytes and terabytes in mm-hmm. 1982, 64K <laughs> and loaded with the game Pong. Remember Pong? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? And did, did anybody foresee where we, we would be in 40 years with the incredible advancements, microchips, GPS, and all this stuff, kind of stuff? Well, I think it's 1982 in the microbiome and that... Uh, This stuff is gathering steam. It's going to happen faster than 40 years. Uh, We're going to have incredibly effective ways to deal with numerous diseases. In other words, we're not, we're not that far away from saying, if you're depressed, here's the microbiome solution for it. If you have rheumatoid arthritis, here's the microbiome solution for it. If you have colon cancer, Here's the microbiome solution. I think we're approaching that level of efficacy. We still need lots and lots of data, of course, but it's it's starting to come out now. So it's an incredibly exciting time where the, the script of healthcare is being rewritten. But Dr. Sign, you know, you know this, that trying to educate physicians whose training and education was 10, 20, or 30 years ago, and, you know, even though uh, when I was in training in medical school, we got a little bit about microbiology. It was all about salmonella and about uh, infections and tuberculosis. It wasn't about um, a methodical, systematic, logical 
uh, restoration of the microbiome. It's going to be very different. So unfortunately, most practicing physicians are not paying attention to this. So there's, we've got a lot of work doing educating both public and physicians. Mm -hmm. Even from our naturopathic perspective, I would say in our training, we weren't actually taught the different elements and the strains and all of that. It was just, here's your gut protocol, fish oil, glutamine, and probiotic, Mm -hmm. and out you go. (laughs) So we've we've done a lot of unlearning and learning in the last 12, 13 years too, to see that there's just so much intricacy that we just don't know yet. Yeah. 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 So we always like to finish our conversation off with this one question that is focused a bit more on the bigger picture of you and your imprint that you'd like to leave on, on this earth. So if if you knew that tomorrow was your last day here, what is the message that you would like to leave behind for humanity? That putting aside enlightened people like you two, insight into health does not come from the doctors. It comes from personal effort. You know, I'm talking about mainstream doctors. You know, if if you go to the hospital, you're not going to get anybody who knows a thing about health. If you go to the local MD, the primary care doc, he knows almost nothing about health. And it shouldn't be that way, right? Health care should be about health, not about generating revenues for the health care system via pharmaceuticals and procedures. And so I, I, I think I've done a little of my part just to open people's eyes to the fact that um, you got to do your homework. You got to decide who's, what the source. I mean, if, if we can't rely on agencies, federal agencies or educational agencies, like, you know, various associations, uh, where do you get your information from? That's tough because there's a lot of misinformation too. But I hope I've allowed people to become skeptical that conventional health care is a solution to health. It's not. Yeah, it's a powerful message. And Dr. Davis, you absolutely have been transforming the conversation in such a profound way. And you know, we're just grateful you took the time to be with us today and share with our audience. And yeah, I look forward to learning from you some more. Well, thanks, guys. My pleasure. Thank you.